<laughs> right. So this is about non-malleable codes. I, I hope um, I, I also have, well, I'll motivate them, and I'll also have some stuff that uh, hopefully you'll enjoy, even if you don't care about non-malleable codes. But let me first try to make you. <laughs> okay, so this is joint work of my student, uh, Ishan Chattopadhyay. So the, um, one way to motivate this is by trying to circumvent classical bounds in coding theory, as I discussed in my lightning talk. Um, so if we want to circumvent bounds, of course, we have to relax the requirements. So the, the first idea is to use a randomized encoder. And we'll have a deterministic decoder. This is deterministic as a function. It could be a randomized algorithm, but it will be deterministic as a function. And we'll only require correct decoding with high probability over the encoder's coins. In order to explain that, we'll need, we'll need an alternative view of corruption. So as I mentioned in the lightning talk, our view is the following. So an adversary. Um, we imagine an adversary deciding in advance if, if code word C is sent, I'll corrupt it to F of C, and doing it for each, for each code word. So this defines a tampering function from n bits to n bits. Um, and um, we'll, we'll only allow the adversary to choose F from some tampering function family. So this tampering function family is a subset of all functions from n bits to n bits. So the most, one of the most natural ones is just an additive tampering function family. So for each uh, error vector e, we'll just define the function f of x equals x plus e. Um, so this is a natural family. And with randomized encoding, um, Gorswami and Smith show that you can, you can achieve capacity um, in the worst case setting. So. Um, <coughs> So here we allow any error vector with weight less than pn. So this is, this is better than, po than is possible with deterministic encoding in this sort of worst case model where we allow randomized encoding. We're not going to focus on um, error correction. We're going to focus on error detection. So, so focusing on error detection, uh, several authors defined algebraic manipulation detection codes. And here, surprisingly, you don't need any restriction on the weight of E. So again, we have a randomized encoder, a deterministic decoder that can also output error, so just to detecting the error. So what we want is um, we want to be able to decode. We want the decoder to invert the encoder, of course, for all, for all strings s. The other condition is that um, uh, for any message that's sent and for any error vector E, the decoder should, um, it should either output the original message or output the string error. At least it should do this with high probability, with probability at least 1 minus epsilon. So it's a natural model. Uh, the, they show that you can achieve a rate approaching 1. And there are some cryptographic applications of this. Um, so a, a lot of this is motivated by cryptography. So it's natural to ask, can we tolerate more tampering functions. So we, again, we want the decoder to invert the encoder, we, and we want the decoder to output either the original message or, the, or error with high probability. But here, we can't even handle constant functions. So if we have a function f that always outputs the string w, well, maybe w is the encoding of some string s prime. So if we want to obey the first property, we better have the decoder output s prime. But then, then it will violate the second condition if some other message s is sent. <coughs> so we, we can't hope to achieve this. The saving grace here is that at least the decoder output is uncorrelated with the original string s. So in our example, we're always outputting s prime. That's not correlated with the message s. And sometimes these are the most dangerous correlations. So there's a f whole field of cryptography called non-malleable cryptography. And here, the, the, the idea is that you can't compute the encryption of some function of a message given the encryption of some message. So in contrast to RSA, for example, or textbook RSA, right, if you square the message, uh, so even if you, 
if you're given the encryption of some message, you don't know what the message is. But from that encryption, you could compute the encryption of the square of the message. Right? That's, that's malleable. And that, that can be dangerous in certain situations. So you want to avoid that. And that's sort of the motivation for, for this, that we want to avoid this kind of thing. So that's so. Um, so Zimbowski, Pichizak, and Wix define non-malleable codes uh, in this manner. So they. So again, we have some fixed family of tampering functions. We have a non-malleable code with respect to f. It consists of a randomized encoder, deterministic decoder. They invert each other, and. And here's the, the main point, that for any tampering function, either the decoder is equal to s or it's uncorrelated with s. OK, so at least we don't have these, these devastating, um, the adversary can't do something devastating where they can, um, they can trick you into thinking a different message was sent. How do we formalize that? So we formalize it this way. Um, I won't be using, going into, OK, so here's the formalization. So we say that um, for any tampering function, there's some distribution. So this is going to be, uncor there's a distribution that's uncorrelated, doesn't depend on the message s. So this message, this distribution is on all, all possible messages and the string called same, such that the following holds. So let's, let's put, try to parse this. Um, we, we have this function copy. So if, copy, if, if the string df takes the value same, then copy of same y is y. So, so this copy of df s is just equal to s. So this just says we decode correctly. And if, if the copy, if, if, we don't, if we never output the value same, then copy is just the first string. So then it's, then it's just saying the decoder outputs this distribution df. So either it outputs a distribution df that's independent of the message s, or it outputs s. Or really, it, really it's a convex combination of those two scenarios. So yep. in this, the encoder mapping is random. So that, that first <coughs> line really means that for every possible, the uh, whole support of s in the distribution will all be mapped back to s, right? Exactly. Right. Right. So good. Right. So there are many different possible values of the, of the encoding of s, and all of them have to be decoded back to s. Yes. Is there any common randomization on the encoder-decoder side? Or? Oh, the, there's no shared randomness. The decoder doesn't have access to the randomness that the encoder uses. Yeah, things become easier if there's shared randomness, but there's none here. David? What is the subtraction? Or is it like a statistical distance? Oh, yeah, sorry. Th this is statistical distance. So the variation distance or half the L1 norm. Okay, so of course we're interested in the rate, and we're interested in this epsilon, the, the error probability. So let's just look at a, an easy example. Um, that's when we have these fixed functions, these constant functions that just output some string w. Right, so here, for any s, our decoder will just output the decoder of w. And then we can, we can choose any code. Any code is non-malleable with respect to this, because we can set df to be the decoder of w always. And it will satisfy the other definition. Yes, so that's that's sort of trivial. In general, we may have any subset of all the doubly exponentially many functions from n bits to n bits. Um, and it's, it's not hard to see there can't exist a non-malleable code against all functions. The, the functions we'll be interested in are called uh, C split state. Well, it's the C split state model. So here we have the n bit. We have all n bits. We divide it into c blocks of length n over c, and we allow an arbitrary corruption in each block. Okay, so we still have doubly exponential. We still have a lot of functions. I mean, it's doubly exponential, but not not. It's not all the functions. Okay, we want to handle these functions. And so the motivation for this is again cryptographic. Uh, so um, so there's, it's useful in tamper resilience. Here, if an adversary tampers separate parts of um, memory independently, um, you can handle that with something called tamper resilient signature cards. And there's also there's uh, something called non-malleable secret sharing. Here, um, 
the, secret, the shares of all parties can be independently modified. Usually that's devastating to a, a secret sharing scheme, but in this case, um, still the, the coalition can't be fooled into reconstructing a correlated secret. Okay, so the, I won't go into those, but it has some applications. Okay, so now what's possible? So existentially, uh, Chirakshi and Guruswamy showed that there are codes, non-malleable codes, in this model that achieve rate approaching 1 minus 1 over C with exponentially small error. Of course, we want explicit codes. Um, so the first uh, explicit code was um, Zimbowski, Kasana, and uh, Abrams Abramski, um, who, show who showed they showed how to just encode one-bit messages. So that was the first. The first uh, to achieve polynomial rate was Agrawal, Dodis, and Lovett, who achieved polynomial rate um, with pretty good error. Um, Jirakshi and Guruswamy looked at, a, looked at the bitwise tampering model. So C equals N, you're allowed to tamper each bit independently. And they showed how to get a rate approaching one with um, some so exponential error. So our, so our main result, we showed, we showed how to get, if we just have uh, C equals 10, we can achieve constant rate and exponentially small error. And we, we can also get, we can also improve the bound of um, Mahdi and Venkat by getting um, exponentially small error instead of this n to the 1 7th. So, Again, prior to our work, w the best known was this polynomial rate um, if, if you wanted any C, which is little o of n. Okay, so that's, so that's the main result here, this, this constant, sorry, this one, the, the constant rate non-malleable code. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to, first I, I want to talk a little bit about codes and randomness extractors, so, so I'll, I'll, this won't, have anything to do with non-malleable codes, so even if you don't care about them, you, um, you may care about this. And then I'll, sk I'll sketch the construction. I'll give a one side introducing additive combinatorics, which is, has interesting problems if, if you haven't seen that. Okay, so codes from extractors. We're gonna use, so we're gonna use a, a connection discovered by Mahdi and Venkat um, that certain non-malleable extractors give non-malleable codes. But before defining that, I'm going to review randomness extraction. Okay. So randomness extractors are designed to handle imperfect random sources. And there are many non-obvious applications in, in a variety of different areas. So we, we measure the randomness of a source by its min entropy. This tends to be more convenient than entropy. And it's just the, you just look at the largest probability of the distribution. If the largest probability is 2 to the minus k, the min entropy is k. And so what you'd like to do, ideally, is convert this low-quality randomness into high-quality randomness. You can't do this deterministically if all you have is a bound on the min entropy. But what you can do is you can add a uniformly random seed y. And then the output of the extractor will be close to the uniform distribution, again, in statistical distance. And this is called a seeded extractor. Um, and the length of the seed doesn't even have to be very big. It could be just logarithmic, and you can achieve this. A strong seeded extractor um, does the same thing, except it has a, a somewhat stronger property that the output of the extractor is uniform, even conditioned on the seed y. So this is interesting even if, if the string y is quite big. The output of the extractor is, is, is close to uniform, even conditioned on the seed. And we have some very good um, seeded extractors where the min entropy, as long as it's at least polylogarithmic, we can output almost all the randomness. The, the, output, the output length is, say, 99% of the min entropy. And, and the seed length is, is logarithmic. Okay, so now let's talk about a connection with coding. So extractors relate to list decoding. 
In fact, there's, I'll give you a, an alternative proof of the Johnson bound in list decoding, uh, viewing it as an extractor. So at a high level, I'm just going to say a code with good distance is an extractor, and an extractor gives good list decoding. So let's, so let's look at that. Okay, so we're going to fix some code with very high minimum distance. So the, it's a binary code. The distance is epsilon squared away from a half. Um, and I'm going to, I'm, what I can do is define a, a strong seated extractor as follows. It's, the input to the extractor is the, the code word. This is sort of the, the weak random source, the imperfect random source. The seed is going to be an index i in 1 through n. So the extractor, uh, given a code word, and, and the index just outputs vi. Okay, so, so it's a very simple function. And I claim that it's a, that it's a strong seeded extractor. Okay, and this is, this is basically the, the leftover hash lemma, if, if you've seen that. So let's take a look. What, what do we have to show? We have to show, let v be some set of code words that has size at least 1 over epsilon squared. We have to show that this that a v, little v is chosen from this set randomly, and i is chosen uniformly at random. The extractor output will be close to uniform. So that so that's what d is. D is the distribution if we pick i uniformly at random, and v from our set of vectors v. We want to show that d is close to uniform. That will show that it's a strong seeded extractor. And why is this? We can just analyze this by looking at the collision probability of this distribution. The collision probability means we sample twice independently from this distribution, and we look at the probability that they're equal. Okay. And so it's basically an L2 norm. Okay, so we sample twice from this distribution D. What's the probability that they're equal? Well, the prob we sample an i and an i prime from 1 through n. The probability that those are equal is exactly 1 over n. Now let's assume i equals i prime. We sample v and v prime independently from this set of vectors v. Well, if v equals v prime, then these are equal. That happens with probably 1 over the size of v. If v doesn't equal v prime, then we know that there are, um, there are, n there are most n minus d coordinates where they're equal. Because the, the distance is d, so there are at most n minus d coordinates where they're equal. So the probability that we get a, that, that uh, vi equals v prime i is, is at most 1 minus d over n. And that's, that's basically it. If you work it out, you get this 1 plus 4 epsilon squared over 2n. And, if, and it's not too hard to see, just going from L2 to L1, that this implies that the statistical distance from d to uniform is less than epsilon. Okay, so it's... Um, you know, if, if I went too quickly, you, it's easy to go home and just double check this. Okay, and, and now we're ready to prove the, the Johnson bound. It follows like almost one line. Um, so um, here we have a code. Um, so what the Johnson bound says that there aren't too many code words with, within distance half minus epsilon of a received word R. Okay, so why is that? So let V be the close code words, and let D be this distribution that we just discussed. Now I claim that, that, that D minus U is at least epsilon, because there's a statistical test showing this. Namely, we just look at the probability that I V I equals I, comma, the received word I. These vectors are all, you know, are all within half minus epsilon of the received word. That means the probability that they equal Ri is at least half plus epsilon. Okay, so this is so this probability is at least half plus epsilon, um, but in the uniform setting, it would be just exactly half. So that that distinguishes it by epsilon by epsilon. Okay, and then by the previous what we saw previously, if v is at least l, then the, then the, these differ by less than epsilon. So that's a contradiction. Okay, so this is, a, this is a proof of the Johnson bound via randomness extraction. So it's kind of neat that these two seemingly just different areas uh, sort of independently have 
basically the same proof. Okay, so that's an aside. So, okay, back to non-malleable. Um, so I have like, okay, so here's, so, uh, so in order to define the right kind of extractor, I need to, first let me tell you a seated non-malleable extractor is, um, it's a, it's a strengthening of a strong extractor. So in a strong extractor, we conditioned on the seed Y. Now we're not only conditioning on the string Y, but we're conditioning on the extractor output of a, with, a, with a correlated seed F of Y. So F of F is any function with no fixed points. And we still get to see the extractor output um, of X with F of Y, and we still shouldn't be able to predict the extractor output of X and Y. So for example, if the extractor ignores a bit of the seed, it's not non-malleable. Because then this function f can just flip the bit that's ignored. And, and then the extractor output of x, f of y, will equal the extractor output of x and y, and, and this won't hold. So it's a very strong definition. It takes some time to get used to. But um, in some earlier work, we did succeed in, in constructing these. Um, so, but the real extractor that, that Mahdi and Venkat introduced um, is, is slightly more general. Now you're allowed to corrupt not just, not just a C, but you're allowed to co co corrupt all the inputs to the extractor. So now you're given C independent sources. You're allowed to, to corrupt all X1 through Xc, and you still have this property that even get conditioned on that, the, ex the output is, is close to uniform. So it takes some time to digest, um, but this is, this is what, what's needed. Um, right, so it was introduced by Tarakshi and Kuroswami, who sh sh they showed the probabilistic existence, and um, the question was, can you construct it? And so oh, also, um, Mahdi and Venkat show that if you can construct such a, see this non-malleable extractor, then you have your non-malleable code. And the non-malleable code is, is easy to define. The decoder is actually the non-malleable extractor. The encoder inverts the, inverts the extractor. So it picks a random element from the inverse image of, of the message. So the, the inverse image of, of the extractor. Okay. And um, so we have, so this gives a code. So I'll just say that, uh, so we, we managed to construct this extractor, and then by their result, plus we had to give an efficient sampler for this non-malleable extractor, we gave a non-malleable code. Um, and then by another reduction of Mahdi and Venkat, uh, we, we got the other result for bitwise tampering. Um, so let me, so I have, what, five minutes? So let me go ahead and try to get something that, okay, so you could show that some other things fail. Let me, um, so just to get a sense of why this is hard, you know, here, here's something that fails, right? So this is actually a seeded non-malleable extractor, but it, it fails in this setting um, because the extractor could, could corrupt x to 2x, could corrupt y to y over 2, and then, and then the extractor of f with these corrupted inputs actually equals the extractor on x and y. So it's, 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 it's hard to think of candidates here. Okay. So what we, did, what we did was come up with an intermediate goal. The intermediate goal was just to say that given this, these, the extractor output on these corrupted strings, the W that we want still has some entropy. I won't go into that, but let me, let me just uh, intro introduce additive combinatorics in case some of you haven't seen it. I'll just say a few words about that. So, you're, so even if you didn't follow what I was saying, you could tune in again. So, so this says, um, so here we define if A is a set of integers, then A plus A is a set of pairwise sums. And you can see that this is useful. Um, you know, it came up in um, the talk on polar codes, where they were looking at some sets. So you can ask, how big can the set be, A plus A? So A plus A 
it can be less than 2a if a is an arithmetic progression. And similarly, you can have a times a less than 2a if a is a geometric progression. And what Erdős Stone and Elikesh and, uh, and some improvements show that they can't both be small at the same time. So this is over the reals for the moment. They show that either the, either the sum set or the product set has to increase the size of A by a noticeable amount. And what's useful is that um, Borgans, Katz, and Tao showed that this holds even in finite fields. So in finite fields, of course, you can't take A to be the whole finite field. Then it can't grow. But as long as A, so we're working in FP, if A is, if a is at most P to the point 0.9, uh, then you get some bound like this with a smaller constant but bigger than 1. And, and, this, and this is useful. This has had applica applications. And this is, um, and we use things related to this. In fact, so one thing that's related is um, if A, B, and C have equal size, then the size of A, B plus C grows. Somehow you can't, you know, the only way to prevent A, B from growing is if they're sort of designed to handle multiplication and then they're not designed to handle addition and then it grows. So these kinds of, this property has, has, has found a bunch of uses, and this is another example that we found. So we, using it directly doesn't work, um, but what, what we do is, um, our idea is sort of to encode the sources. So we encode sources by x and then some polynomial, it turns out this polynomial is a good polynomial to choose. And then our, um, and then to achieve the intermediate goal, we just need to do some, we just need to add encodings. And this is coordinate-wise multiplication. So we just need to add encodings and do coordinate-wise multi coordinate multiplication, do it a couple of times. We achieve the intermediate goal. And then our final thing is W is the intermediate goal. Then we, we have to use the seeded non-malleable extractor, which has been done earlier um, with, with the remaining two sources as seed, and that gives us our non-malleable extractor. Um, and to do this, we have to prove a, we have to do some some product estimate. Um, it's it's hard to parse this, but you just have to know that things work out well as long as as long as your set is not contained in certain um, planes that look of a certain form, and our encoding ensures that the these AIJs intersect with planes of that form in, in few places. And that, um, that's a very high level, vague idea of what's going on. Um, OK, so in conclusion, we give the first constant rate non-malleable code in the C-split state model for any C little o of n. We achieve C equals 10. There's actually a new reduction um, of Agarwal, Dodas, Kasana, Obremsky. That, um, so if combined with that, you get c equals 2. So they show how to, how if you get any constant, you can get the constant down to 2. And we achieve optimal error. And um, so we can, and we can also do well in the bitwise case. So open questions. Um, so our, our rate is, is constant, but it's still a small constant. Can we get rate close to half or at least something, you know? that I could tell you publicly. <laughs> um, are there other uses of non-malleable codes? So can I make you care about them more than you do now? <laughs> um, are there better non-malleable extractors? And finally, are there further connections between coding theory and randomness extraction? You know, that there are several interesting ones, and I think there's more there. OK, thanks. Questions? <coughs> oh, yeah. So, does your proof give you the Johnson bar for all distance parameters? Um, for all. So you're getting it at half minus epsilon for what if the distance is, you know, point one. Right. So you, you mean? Um, yeah, but I, I think you could just choose epsilon. In the binary setting, you can choose epsilon. I think so. Small, it works for yeah, it works for anything. I think so. And you can't lose constants then, right? So we can't. You don't want to lose constants because you know. Right. I, I, 
Yeah. So I'm. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I, I think it. I think it does match it. Any more questions? So if not, I guess we're done for today. Thanks, everybody.